Well, hi there, and welcome to our Bible study on 2 Corinthians on the Lighthouse Discord server. Before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, how much we love you. Our heart's desire is to serve you. Our heart's desire is to draw close to you. Lord, there's many needs represented on the server. We keep seeing prayer requests. Sometimes, Lord, they're repeat. Sometimes there's something that somebody else can relate to. But Father, you know all of our lives. You know all of our situations. You know our hurts. You know our physical ailments. You know our spiritual needs. You know what we need most of all. And so today, Lord, I lift every single prayer request before you today, spoken or written and unspoken. And I ask that you would meet each need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Be with us today in our study. Lead us, guide us, show us how you want us to live. Speak through your servant, Lord. Prepare our hearts and allow us to be changed and renewed in you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. So we're talking here today about 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We may get through chapter 5 too. We'll see how our time goes. But chapter 4 in the NASB reads, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke, we also believe, therefore we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, do not lose heart. But through our outer man is decaying, or sorry, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So that's the entirety of chapter four. 
Now, the first six verses, the big picture of this is that Paul gets right to the core of spiritual warfare, revealing for his readers that the one we battle is in reality the God of this age, who has blinded the minds of those who oppose Christ's ministry. And in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1, he writes, we do not lose heart. You see, though there's a period following that sentence in the New King James Version, we could properly place an exclamation point at the end of this triumphant declaration from Paul. Because in making that victorious statement, Paul used a military metaphor that literally refers to someone who cowers in a corner after surrender to his enemy. I don't know if you've ever seen, I have never seen a, uh, a movie about this, but I have seen teenagers, one in particular I'm thinking of, who for whatever reason would cower under a table or under a desk or whatever when he thought he did something wrong. This was a, one of the youth I worked with years and years ago and it's so odd to me to see someone cower it's like they're that afraid they're that nervous um to do that and yet paul here even though this person was cowering in a corner after a surrender to the enemy or at least that's the metaphor that paul was using what we need to understand here is that Paul was utterly unwilling to surrender. There was no such thing as surrender in his worldview. Why? Well, he refused to retreat. He was called by God to be a minister of the message of the cross in 1 Corinthians 1.18, or what he refers to in this letter as the new covenant and strengthened by God's mercy in the midst of merciless attacks, he would not lay down his arms and cower in the face of Christ's enemy. Now, how would you or I react? God calls us into ministry. God calls us to do something, and we're constantly beaten down. We're constantly attacked. How do we react? Do we fight back or do we just stand our ground? You see, unlike those who serve the enemy of God rather than the son of God, Paul was not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Look at 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2. He renounced or refused to stoop to such shameful tactics. And as we've already established, unlike the pseudo-apostles who tried so desperately to undermine Paul's genuine apostolic authority, Paul never resorted to gimmickry or manipulation techniques for his own personal profit. He preached biblical truth in a way that everyone with a clear or undefiled conscience would recognize, and in a way that met with God's approval since he was ministering in the sight of God. Now, his perspective, Paul said is, was both commendable and instructive because every one of God's servants will experience opposition. In fact, tares had been planted in the church in Corinth. Tares as in T-A-R-E-S. False teachers had infiltrated the congregation and they were sowing their seeds of deception and division. Now we know the source of these tares, that is the God of this age who has blinded those who do not believe, according to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. They are perishing, a word that has now become all too familiar with the readers of 1 and 2 Corinthians. Their minds are darkened to the truth. They don't believe the truth and they have put a lid on the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So take heart. 
especially if you are on the rope spiritually. Spiritual warfare is the name of the game when it comes to serving Christ. Paul told Timothy, the ministry is a good fight in 1 Timothy 1.18. We fight. Yes, we fight. But we do not fight alone. The God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, has called us to shine the light of truth in the darkness of error and spiritual opposition. He will sustain us in the battle just as he sustained Paul by his grace. So then verses 7 to 15, the big picture is that Paul was encouraged to remain in the fight because he, or he had, an eternal perspective. This is honestly one of his most transparent passages, one in which he gives us a glimpse into the humble soul of this great apostle. I wonder if we all realize that the gospel is a treasure. And this treasure has been entrusted to us, men and women who are nothing more than earthen vessels. See, God did this purposefully because given our human weaknesses, the impact of the gospel is an evidence not of the power of people, but of the power of God. And I know James and I were talking about this in our staff room this morning, the simple fact that none of us can do what really what we would like to do none of us are well equipped doesn't matter how long you've been to bible school doesn't matter if you've even been to bible school doesn't matter what you've done or what your skills are or any of those things the reality is that god works through his earthen vessels now why would we call ourselves an earthen vessel well, if you look at Adam, he was made from dust. And we're descended from there. So think about that. And expanding upon this earthen vessel theme, Paul penned one of his most transparent statements. If we had any doubt about the severity, excuse me, My apologies there. So, as I was saying, we don't fight alone. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 reads, The God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has called us to shine the light of truth in the darkness of error and spiritual opposition. He will sustain us in the battle just as he sustained Paul by his grace. Okay. I repeat myself there. Going back to earthen vessels. See, if we have any doubt about the severity of the struggles that had engulfed this battle-weary apostle, I don't think we can say that we can doubt anymore. Paul suffered through indignities that few of us will ever see or even imagine. Paul and those who ministered with him truly were lights shining out of a very dark place. And Paul knew that apart from God's presence and power in his life, he was nothing special. He was an unadorned jar of clay. And likewise with his fellow sufferers who were also battered by troubles. But their spirits weren't crushed. At times their heads were spinning with confusion, yet they did not despair. They were persecuted relentlessly, yet never felt abandoned by God. They may have been knocked down, but they could not be knocked out. Now, think about that for a moment compared to today's Christian. Look at these well-dressed men and women. Look at these fancy churches. Look at what's being shared and you know taught and sung and the equipment 
you know, uh, we have someone on the server training to be a worship pastor, and we have others who are in Bible school or have completed Bible school or who lead worship in their church or whatever. And here's Paul and his cohorts suffering. We don't understand in the Western world. There may be other parts of the world that do better than us, but we don't get it, honestly. And the suffering that they were experiencing was merely a continuation of the suffering that was endured by Jesus. Whoa. You see, what had been done to Jesus the false accusations, the beatings, the mockery, and ultimately his murder, the crucifixion, was exactly what was being done to them. Now, I'm not going to go further into that, but to say that in that context, these men felt privileged to suffer on Christ's behalf, both men and women. And as Paul wrote to the church, in Coloss, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. The church of Coloss or Colossae, this is from Colossians 1, verse 24. So the ironic twist was this. Paul's suffering an eventual death at the hands of the enemies of Christ. And by the way, Paul was eventually martyred for his faith. Look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. Actually resulted in scores of people, including the Christians in Corinth, receiving eternal life. So citing Psalm 116, verse 10, a hymn of praise for God's deliverance, of the psalmist's soul from death, Paul asserted his unshakable confidence that even if they killed him, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 14, he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus. Because Paul believed that with absolute confidence, he was able to speak on Christ's behalf with equal confidence. It's as if he was saying to the Corinthians, hey, what's the worst thing they can do to me? Kill me? Ah, even if they do that, God will raise me from the dead and let me live with him forever. So what do I have to lose? Honestly, Paul's perspective was truly eternal. Billy Graham wrote, the desire to gain a better understanding of death has been called the new obsession. I certainly don't want to be unbalanced in thinking about this subject but I am convinced that when we know where death leads, we will know the hope of the glory spoken of by Paul in Colossians 1, verse 27. Then we get into verses 16 to 18 of 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Here, Paul got it right. All things considered, relatively speaking, his afflictions were light when compared to the blessings he was receiving day by day. And one of those daily blessings was God's renewing of Paul's soul. Yes, they could beat Paul's body, but they could not touch that inner part of him, his essence, his soul. And this sounds reminiscent of Jesus' words to his disciples in Matthew 10, 28. 
do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body and hell. You see, Paul knew that his body was expendable and that his soul was safely in God's hands. So despite the problems and pressures he faced every day, he was able to throw himself into his God-given ministry, knowing all the while that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Paul described himself as an ambassador for Christ and his ministry as one of reconciliation. Everywhere he went, in everything he wrote or said, and in everything he did, he had that identity in mind. Paul saw himself as a citizen of heaven, temporarily assigned to earth to reconcile people with their Lord. Now, I personally love that. Because really, that's where we should be too. So I'm going to actually stop our time here and we'll carry on with chapter five next time. Let's pray. Lord, it's not always easy for us to look beyond the various things in our lives and see just how much you love us, just how much you care for us. The fact of the matter is that what is happening here in our lives today is temporary. It's a drop in the bucket to eternity. And some call me old. I'm not young for sure. But it's still my life, my age is a drop in the bucket to eternity. It's really no different than someone who's a three-year-old or a five-year-old or even a 13 or a 15-year-old. The fact of the matter is that we have a very, very long time to spend in eternity with you when we give our lives over to you. Paul got it. Help us to get it. Help us to understand, Lord, that serving you with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole body is literally to give ourselves to you. Not always easy. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we hurt other people. But I pray, God, that you would help us to recognize when we do that we would seek your forgiveness first, that we would apologize and try to make amends to those whom we have hurt and to let go those things that we cannot change so that you will renew us, you will strengthen us, you will change us, transform our lives, that we would draw closer to you and become more like you, Lord. That's truly our heart's desire. That's truly our heart's goal. Help us, Lord, to get to that place. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.